Hello, I'm Llewellyn Kane, the host of MECFS Alert. Today it comes to you from Bethesda, Maryland, and a conference room at the National Institutes of Health. Today I'm joined by Dr. Walter Koroshetz, Director, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at the National Institutes of Health. Also by Dr. Zaha Nari, Chief Scientific Officer and Vice President for Research at Solve MECFS Initiative. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Nal, Nali, yes, sir. Uh, how, how did you get into myalgic encephalomyelitis as a field? You've been in it for two years? I've been here for two years, a little bit over two years. I was taking a job in New York City. My background is in cancer genetics and obesity and diabetes. And then I went to the Kennedy School to do policy and public policy and management, so something in addition to science. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, to cut a long story short, Luan and I was taking a job at a very prestigious uh, medical center in New York City, and I was flipping Science Magazine one time, and I saw this announcement about MECFS. I was offended because I never heard of it. I thought I was in vanguard places. I thought I knew about the major problems in science, I never heard of it. I was a, a, a faculty at Wild Cornell. I never heard anyone coming, giving a seminar about this. So I called them and I said, what's this about? And I turned down that job uh, and I went through a series of interviews because I believe that you have to put some time in your life, whether it's one day, whether it's 10 years, whether it's a lifetime, towards the disenfranchised, and the poor and, and, and the, the voiceless. And this MECFS is a prototype for disenfranchised patients mm -hmm. where you can make a difference, where you can use your skills and knowledge and talent towards advancing and, and affecting change. And that's the curiosity that brought me to the field. Dr. Kurshetz, sure. how have you reacted uh, to myalgic and self since you've been in the field, since it's been in your portfolio of diseases? Right. Well, I think you know, as I, I mentioned you before, were surprised at the how prevalent it is, or surprised at you know, the depth of the the suffering? Um, any particular surprise? Or you no. Know, so I had prior to coming to here, I was a neurologist in practice, and I took care of patients who had MECFS. So I was pretty cognizant about the problem. In that and, role, were there any uh, a palliatives that you found help patients or? possibly cures for some aspects? No, when I never, you know, that's, one thing I have so never, I can't say that any of the patients were cured. I think uh, we, as a physician, I was managing symptoms, trying to improve as best I could what some of the symptoms were. And some of them were, I think we were successful, but not in all cases. Um, uh, but I think at NIH, it's a different story. At NIH, you know, where the where are the taxpayers' investment in biomedical research, and so our job is to try to use the taxpayers' money to solve problems that you know are important for the health of the country. And here is a problem that is clearly under resourced and uh, and is a major challenge. So this question of under resourced traditionally the the patient cohort has felt very short changed sure. by, by NIH. Now they may feel somewhat better that some money, but not an awful lot, yeah. uh, is beginning to trickle through. And I'm sure they're grateful to uh, Dr. Collins, uh -huh. the director of NIH, uh -huh. uh, of the National Institutes of Health, uh, that is, um, uh, for starting this ball rolling. Uh, can patients hope that there will be more money, more passion, more enthusiasm, more research as time goes on? I think definitely yes. I think that uh, the purpose here, as I mentioned, is to start the centers to bring in more researchers to, to bring in grants. So, so this, this center program is an outlier in what NIH does. The majority of the funds go to grants that come in from researchers and then go to peer review. But I would say, you know, our pay line is 12%, which means that 
88% of the grants don't get funded. So we're in an incredibly competitive environment here. And, uh, and so that is a, quite a shocking statistic. That is a shocking statistic, but that is the fact that, mm. that the, the, to get a grant from NIH, you actually have to write 10 to get one. And if we get 20 or 30 MECFF grants a year, that would be a good year. It's like getting a novel published. Uh, yeah. I think but about the same odds. Right. But the, the, I, I haven't right. written a novel. But the average grant is 443000 uh, $443, So over five years, you're talking close to $2 million for every grant. So the taxpayer wants to make sure that at the end of that grant, you get something that's solid. And that's how the system goes. But MECFS, we need to get that Dr. Nali, your organization raises money for research, uh, so it's not totally dependent. What's going on in research is not 100% dependent on uh, NIH, but it is dependent on money from donors. And I'm wondering why the big foundations haven't moved. Big foundations traditionally have played a big role in medicine. Yeah when they've been able to put tens of millions of dollars into a particular uh, quest for a solution. Yeah, absolutely. All our funding, 100% of it, Llewellyn, comes from uh, individual donors, from single donors, from donations. Sometimes people send us $10, $5 from their disability checks. And sometimes folks uh, write bigger checks. So all our funding come from uh, the good nature and goodwill of patients uh, and their family or just good-natured individual blessed with abundance in the United States and abroad. Now, uh, I believe things like the Institute of Medicine report, things like the legitimacy that the NIH now is stamping our disease with in terms of rolling out centers, uh, serious tractable centers with serious people, will signal to the big foundations that now is the time to start investing uh, the dollars we have into this major health crisis. Uh, and, and you know changes at the CDC, updating the websites, disseminating the correct information, the current information. All of these have um, practical uh, outcomes, uh, like for instance with the NIH, developing the infrastructure for science, doing actual research, doing discovery but also a psychological factor and a public factor, public service factor, in, uh, again, putting the stamp of legitimacy as it should be and as it should have been for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Again, I close by what Dr. Collins said two years ago when he announced bolstering uh, MECFS research at the NIH or decisions to bolster. You know, you know, one of the many mysterious illnesses that science has yet to unravel, MECFS, mm -hmm has proven to be one of the most challenging. Now, that's the director of the NIH telling you this is one of the most challenging. So for all the big foundations out there, now is the time to hear and listen and heed uh, these, uh, uh, these, these, these major national changes uh, and, and invest in MECFS research anywhere you can. In conclusion, Dr. Karshetz, sure. uh, you mentioned, and it was an interesting human story about your mentor uh, in, in stroke, uh, a study mm -hmm. who uh, had a radical approach and turned right. out to be correct. Is it always in research an individual or is it a collaborative success or failure? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So in the past it was really the individual. There is a difference now in the sense that the tools that we have are different now. They're much more powerful and they require teams to come together yeah, to really make the sense out of those tools. That's absolutely right. So now there's a chance for teams like, so the Genome Project is a great example of you could not do that in an individual lab. You require teams to actually sequence the genome. So I think we need both in, in the MECFS space. Uh, if I had to bet, I would bet that it's going to be an individual researcher that actually hits the goal first, but I could be wrong, it could be the team, but I would, I would still put my money on the individual uh, passionate about the disease, knowing everything he can about the disease and then coming upon some nugget that really helps solve it.
marvelous. Thanks to you both and the best of luck. Right. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. All right. Thank you.